Hi, and welcome to our next session of the Venture and Capital Interviews. Uh, today, I've got the, the Managing Director and Founder of PR Hub, Samantha Dieback. Welcome, Samantha, to the, to the podcast. Hi, Steve. Thanks so much for having me. No problems. And look, obviously, we, we met each other uh, through Jane Spenceley. Uh, we were obviously involved, Jane's, in sort of a lot of different conferences we've been involved in. And this is always an area that, that fascinates me because it's one that I find that most companies are really not that strong on, are not aware of, and secondly, they don't understand the importance of. So to kick off, love for you to give a bit of background uh, about yourself. Okay, excellent. Um, so you've introduced me. Uh, I am the founder and managing director of a company called The PR Hub, which I started in 2013. So, the, And I was working at the time with a former politician uh, in government relations and also managing her profile. So media engagements, uh, speaking engagements, board, board opportunities, ambassador roles. And it, and it was also the same time that the entrepreneurial and startup community was evolving in Australia. And I had the opportunity to be around some amazing young entrepreneurs with some really great companies. But what I noticed is that they really didn't have the inclination all the time to self-promote, to promote what they were doing. And so between the two, you know, my background is not in PR. So my background is in marketing and and running businesses. Um, But I really saw an opportunity to tell those stories, help them tell those stories and let them get on with the job of of building their company. So that was the foundations for the PR Hub back in 2013. Uh, Fast forward seven years, and we represent entrepreneurs, business leaders, high growth, disruptive tech companies across a broad variety of public relations and and communications activities. So it's not so much now, but do you think sort of when you first started, there was a cultural thing about really founders sort of not wanting to stick their head out too far because... Australia definitely had a sort of tall poppy sort of syndrome sort of around that time. Yeah, that's such an interesting observation. So I I think at that time, we certainly weren't using the words like entrepreneur Mm. or startups like we do now. And, you know, sort of everyday conversations. Yeah, I could ask my mom or, you know, my sisters or my brother and and they would have heard that somewhere along the way. So it's, it's definitely, I think it's a category that is more accepted to talk about now. However, you know, the idea of tall poppy syndrome, I think that definitely still exists. And, and that can yeah. be challenging for some people because they sort of err on the side of caution when it comes to publicity and communications because they don't want to, you know, be subject to that. Hey, I think people forget that, right? Because entrepreneur for a long, long time was actually a dirty word. And the other part is I remember for me, like when I was trying to explain people, like when people say, oh, what does wholesale investor do? And I'd try and explain it, you know, I'd use examples like Facebook and, you know, no one really understood that word startup. So I, I, it's actually just like a flashback sort of thinking about that. And now when you think about it, our job as founders is really, our job is to make ourselves as visible as possible going forward. Yeah, look, 100%. Um, there's certainly a, a good way to do that versus, you know, maybe a, maybe a not so good way. Um, but, you know, just to go back to your point about the word entrepreneur, when I started my career, when I was at university, I actually worked for a company called NADS, NADS Hair Removal. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and lots of people remember that company because they're still going strong today. But, it, the, you know, the founder of that company was Sue Ismail. And we certainly didn't talk about entrepreneurs or startups back then. It was just people getting on with the job and starting a business. But what was, what was really relevant then, and, and I guess shapes what our business does today, is the idea of attaching a brand to a founder or to a spokesperson, somebody, a face that somebody can recognize that they can, you know, think is relevant to their situation and to tell that unique story as a way of, you know, as a way of getting the brand out there. And I think when we're talking about founders now having to make themselves really visible and tell their stories, they have to go back to their story. You know, not, not worry about what other people are doing so much, but why is it that you started your business? What were you so passionate about? What, what problem were you trying to solve? And what was, your, what was the history before that that shapes who you are today? Because that's what people find really interesting and that's what, we'll, you know, that's what newspapers and journalists will pick up on too. And how do, you, how do you start that conversation with a founder? Does it kick off with that, you know, for them, they sort of start, like, is that, I suppose this sounds like could be your first session with a company where you're sort of talking about, okay, what's your background? Where'd you come from, et cetera? Yeah, look, the first, the conversation starts off with pretty much business objectives. So, Mm. I mean, we would do a discovery session, of course, to find out 
you know, what, what has been happening in their life, which they sometimes find a bit weird when I'll say, what were you like as a teenager? Um, you know, what were you, did you yeah. go to university? And, and that could have been 20 years ago. Uh, but it's really relevant because that helps shape a unique story. So we start there. But the other really important part is sitting down and saying, well, what are those top two or three business objectives that you've got lined up for the next six or 12 months? Because they should shape the basis of the communications. Now, I love that you said that, right? The first thing you said is, okay, six to 12 months, because I think a lot of us founders, including, you know, including me, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of the companies we work with, we want things instantly, right? But the, the building of a profile, the building of your your own sort of personal brand, it takes time and it takes consistency. So when you're starting out working with a with a company or with a founder, what are some of the common key things that you like to talk to them about? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, again, it's I think it's about setting expectations and asking them what are their business objectives, which I get, I, you know, I think sometimes still founders think, oh, why, does, why do they want to know that? Mm. Um, but ultimately that's sort of what, we judge success on to down the track. So yeah. depending on whether a company might be looking at a capital raise, uh, whether they're launching, you know, a new product or a new feature to a product or they're expanding internationally, uh, th their business objectives, their things that they want to achieve. So naturally the communications has to follow that. Um, and we look at, I mean, now we're, we're in a bit of a different world right now, but generally we would look at six to 12 months as a minimum and, and make sure that we sort of keep that timeline very fluid because, you know, as founders, as business owners, we know things pop up all the time. So sometimes <laughs> those, those things don't go according to plan. So from a capital raising perspective, I, I will make the comment and I do like every time I'm talking with a company, I always say the easiest companies that we have ever worked with are companies that have typically built themselves some sort of profile, whether it be some sort of brand with in startup media, traditional media, but they've already done something at a media level because even though people may not have gauged with them, they've seen the name, they've heard the name, and it's sort of, it's, it's started that process of, you're an unknown company. How do I become known in your, in, in your mind? If you find out a company is looking to sort of set up for a capital raising, how much time do you sort of ask them to, to give you to sort of work with you to build that sort of profile up to, up to that sort of time frame? Yeah, it's, look, that's, that's a good question. Um, and, and we have had that a couple of times because I think we get people approach us at, at various stages. So they may be planning to raise capital hmm. in, you know, six to 12 months time and, and they want to start building that visibility because they know that's what people will be looking for or they are just about to, you know, close a round. So there's, there's a couple different scenarios there in terms of, you know, we're looking, somebody comes to us and says, well, we're about to start raising capital or we're starting to talk to people, but it's, you know, it's on the horizon. Um, I think it's setting the expectation that you can't just assume that you can get a, a top tier Australian financial review or the Australian story in and around your brand pre-cap raise. Uh, unless there's something very newsworthy. And, I, you know, I think, again, it comes back to setting expectations and taking the time to educate people in and around what public relations looks like and also what the media find newsworthy. Um, and that's, that is our job, is to edu is educate people because you can't expect a founder or a company to necessarily understand, you know, a, a um, discipline like public relations if they've never yeah. done it before. And I imagine sometimes you're working with companies, like you mentioned you're working with tech companies. Now, obviously, there's the sort of traditional, there's the traditional media, like you mentioned the AFR as example, but there's also fantastic like setups like Smart Company, um, Startup Daily, Ausbiz and, and so forth that are now sort of mediums for, for founders. Do you also recommend companies going down the path around their specific area? Like let's say it's fintech, there's specific fintech mm -hmm. publications. Like how, how do you sort of, I suppose, combine the messages going to those two different types of audiences? Yeah, look, I, with, with our companies in particular, most of them would have two definitive audiences or even three. So mm. you're looking at what they call the B2B, which is your smart companies, your Ausbiz, yeah. your Startup Daily, your AFRs, and then the B2C, which is often the consumers who use the products. So in the case of a, a hospitality a technology product, we've got a company called Hungry Hungry, who's a client. They, they do um, at-table at ordering technology and digital menus for in-venue. And yeah. so you're looking at an audience, which is the everyday consumer, and then also, you know, tech, tech consumer, tech press, because they're raising capital and looking at investment, and also the hospitality trade press. So that's three distinct 
different audiences. So again, it, you know, it comes back to business objectives and then working out with them is right now the time we want to be targeting the consumer press or do we want to be targeting, say, the business press to start with because we are looking to raise funds? We're looking to get some credibility and, and third-party validation, if you like, in the media to put in front of potential investors. So, it's, you know, it's, that's a really important thing to look at early on. Now, it looks like we share a similar background. Uh, you mentioned about a, a marketing background. Now, when I was sort of learning marketing, and I'm sure when you were learning marketing, we were all taught that if we were going to do branding, then we have to get our brand seen at least six times. And by the time someone sees it six times, then there's some sort of connection. Now, obviously, all of us are inundated with different media. And that from, you know, I've heard different stories that that is now up to, we have to be seen 12 to, to, to 15 times. How do you manage that expectation of the, the founder in that this is how long it's genuinely going to take for you to build that, the brand or the profile that you want to build for yourself? Um, I, I, I like that question. Um, and I have to say that earlier on in the business, I wasn't so good at setting those expectations. So we had a couple really, really well-known clients who yeah. I would say would very proactive in amplifying the media coverage mm. we delivered for them or, you know, the speaking engagements that they did, which helped, you know, build their brands. But then that set an expectation that people would come to us and, and think that they would be like those clients. Um, You're and you can make it, Samantha. We, we, can, we can laugh now, but at the time, you know, I guess I was, you know, it was a bit early on in the journey and um, it was all about, yeah, we can do that. We, we can do that. And then I so, soon realised that it, it is a longer path than, you know, three or six months down the track. Um, so, I mean, look, setting expectations and you talked around, you know, how many times you have to see a piece of coverage for it for it to be judged as, as a good or a successful campaign. Um, the beauty of what we have now in terms of LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, I mean, LinkedIn have just introduced stories as well, is that we have channels that we own that we can amplify that content. Yeah. So just because you were in front of, you were in the AFR, you were on Sunrise uh, Breakfast Television, it doesn't mean that you're just limited to that audience anymore. And as, as clients and as, as PR people, we can help amplify that and control the spread of that coverage, which is, you know, something that maybe we didn't do 10, 15 years yeah. ago. And, and that's fantastic. And let's go to LinkedIn, right? You just mentioned that. So look, I, I think as a, you know, as a founder, I know for me, every time I publish something on LinkedIn, it will have anywhere from 800 up to 15,000 views. And I'll, I got to a point where I was trying to be disciplined and do it daily, but you know, you get busy and sometimes you don't. What would be your, I don't know, encouragement for, for founders about how to, how to what, what perspective should they think about their LinkedIn? And also what should they, how do they maintain that discipline or what, what, what sort of discipline should they be looking at sort of going forward? LinkedIn is a fantastic tool for professionals. I'll say that. I, I think uh, that it's starting to be abused a little bit. I use that word, but maybe that's not the right word. But, you know, people are starting to put content on there that perhaps is better suited to something like an Instagram or a Facebook. And, and you know, I have that conversation with newer clients who are a bit sceptical about using LinkedIn because that's their feedback. Um, but, you know, we do a lot of LinkedIn management for our clients, which means we see that as an extension of their PR and communications campaigns. And let's face it, founders are very, very busy time poor people. Um, and as much as they'd like to, and I think you've raised this, as much as you'd like to be on LinkedIn every day posting and commenting and looking through, you know, what other people are doing, sometimes it's just impossible with your work schedule. Yes. So it's, it's about setting some discipline. And, you know, we always say a good thing to do when you're really time poor is to check in at least once a day or maybe twice a day, set aside five, 10 minutes in the morning, five, 10 minutes in the, in the evening, and just go through LinkedIn, have a look what's happening, comment like, share, uh, engage with that audience because LinkedIn will favour you if they can see that you're using it more regularly. And, you know, and the other thing is, is, you know, perhaps finding someone within the organisation. Um, you know, we have people who are social media, not just in our business, but our clients have people who are social media managers. And so it's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with then appointing somebody who can perhaps help out with some of that content management and content posting to make sure that you are visible there on a regular basis. Gotcha. And... You know, obviously, when businesses, some, you know, obviously, as, as a business owner, you go through ups and downs, right? And we, we're responsible for our communications to, to different stakeholders, to investors, to, you know, different networks, whatever it may be. What would be your, 
guidance as some of the best practices you've seen for companies that have gone through challenging times and how they've sort of communicated those to sort of people in their network? Communication, I mean, we say communication is is the number one thing in our business um, yeah. and being open and visible. So, I th- you know, I think a lot of the time stakeholders and, and investors in particular, they want regular updates. And and that's that's pretty simple. And I think that's a very common mistake. And, and again, maybe it's, it's something due to time is that we're just not giving regular enough updates and people just appreciate an update. What, 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 what would you deem as regular? Uh, look, I think monthly is good yeah. for, you know, for an investor, for stakeholders, I think short, a monthly. Right? Like they're not expecting complete diatribes of, you know, how amazing a breakdown of day by day your uh, activities were. I, I don't think anybody has time to read long papers <laughs> yeah. anymore. And they actually appreciate yeah. if somebody gets, you know, gives you a succinct summary of what's happening. But, you know, I, I think even with our clients, I know that if they're getting regular updates on what's happening, um, that that is key. And, and that's that's often what is needed. And I know as a business owner and, you know, you have staff reporting to you, that's exactly what you want from your staff as well. You just yeah. want to see a top line summary of what's happening and where things are at. Gotcha. And... Let's say the circumstance that someone gets the opportunity to be on a live TV or something like that. Now, I said, I know for, for me, I've done lots of public speaking, you know, done lots of, you know, do lots of videos and so forth. The one thing that freaks me out is live TV. I get very nervous about it. And, you know, I don't, it's, I, I don't know what it is, but I just go into a different zone that I feel completely uncomfortable. What tips would you have for someone if they do get that sort of opportunity to participate on live TV? Practice, practice, practice. Um, and, you know, it, it, I know for me as well, it's, it's the same thing as you've, you've got to go out there and you've got to do it and you've got yeah. to learn from your mistakes. Uh, we, you know, we obviously offer media training to our clients as well, which can be very useful to, to help them. But they're still, they're still going to have those nerves when they go and do that live TV interview for the first time. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's things. You can do a whole range of things. You could go outside and do some, you know, breathing exercises to calm your breathing down and calm your mind down. But honestly, it's just practice and getting up and doing it again yeah. and not being afraid. And, you know, it's, it's just facing that fear and doing it. Good advice. And as a final, um, you know, where, you know, everyone's obviously going through different, everyone's having different experiences about what, what sort of happened over the last three months. And, Look, let's make the assumption that, you know, we're, we're founders, we're passionate, we're proactive, and when there's some sort of normality, we're going to bounce back completely into action above and greater than what was previous. So let's assume all that. What is your advice on how people should handle, the, how, handle their, their profile, their brand, and their sort of how they think about publicity going forward? I think that you should be doing it now. So despite what's been happening, I think COVID has actually been an excellent opportunity for founders to to stop and think about their brand values and where they sit in the marketplace and to create content. And and not to worry too much whether the content is perfect as well. Mm. But right now, people are looking for leadership. They're looking for figures of authority because there's a lot of uncertainty right now. There's people losing jobs. There's people that have been cut back. There's people changing industries. So they're looking for leaders in categories. So it's a perfect opportunity even now for a founder to start to think about where they sit in their industry and start building some content. Good advice. Thank you so much for your time today, Samantha. I really appreciate it. How can people find out sort of more information about what you do and how you work? Um, Look, it's been a great chat. Thanks, Steve. So you can visit our website, theprhub.com.au, or you can also find me on LinkedIn at Samantha Dieback. Perfect. Thanks so much, Samantha. Thanks, Steve. Have a great day. You too.